So today we move on to the third last major segment of the course uh, in our formula of act requirements, mens rea, affirmative defenses. Now we've touched on affirmative defenses a couple times before so um, in the context of attempt and inchoate crimes. We looked at impossibility and abandonment. And then again with conspiracy, we looked at abandonment or renunciation or withdrawal. Unlike those affirmative defenses, the ones described herein are generally applicable. So they're not linked to specific crimes or types of crimes. Uh, there will be limitations, uh, for example, in duress and in justification, we'll see limitations in cases of homicide. Uh, but otherwise, these are applied across the board potentially to any crime, although it's hard to imagine certain crimes uh, being able, if a defendant's charged with certain crimes, they wouldn't be able to take advantage of these affirmative defenses because the nature of the tests uh, involved. Uh, so we're going to look at three major affirmative defenses here. Uh, justification or necessity uh, is the first. Then we look at self-defense and defense of others. And then finally, uh, duress. Um, and so each of these presents unique issues in law, um, but they all start in the same basic place, uh, which is this notion of a choice of evils. Um, that in some situations, if a defendant is avoiding a much greater harm, a much greater evil, uh, and uh, they their criminal conduct can therefore be excused by the criminal justice system. So these defenses apply when a defendant has all the act requirements, all the mens rea, and nonetheless, we say they should be found not guilty. And so many of you are obviously familiar with uh, self-defense, defense of others, sort of as the one type of defense in this area. Uh, but there are other areas. And in fact, I think it's fair to say that justification and necessity is the root uh, through which all these defenses spring. Uh, the idea that somebody might be justified or it might be necessary in a particular situation to commit a crime uh, to avoid a greater harm. Um, and so one example, although there's, I don't know of any case law on this, but uh, an example that's often given is uh, if somebody is mortally wounded or say going into a dangerous uh, uh, labor for delivery to baby uh, and it risks uh, life, right? You know, situations where somebody is going to die, uh, we would think it, it's okay to steal a car to drive the person uh, to the hospital uh, if that's the only alternative available. Um, and so that's what we're getting at when we, we talk about uh, these concepts of affirmative defenses. It's averting greater harms um, in certain discrete defined circumstances because we don't want to allow it to be a large loophole through which defendants could regularly justify and excuse their conduct and not be held liable. So before we get into the three specific types of affirmative defenses, um, I include the case Dixon v. U.S., not really for the facts of the case, uh, which are, you know, it's a duress case, but we, we're going to save duress for our last one. The reason is, is it shows uh, an important development uh, in what it means for an affirmative defense to be an affirmative defense. Um, what makes it different than, say, any other defense argument? Uh, for most of this course, with the, those exceptions I've talked about where we dealt with affirmative defenses before, uh, and maybe just a little bit about intoxication, everything has been where the burdens are on the government, meaning the government has a burden of production, they have to offer evidence, uh, and they have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that, say, a defendant has the requisite mens rea or has committed the act requirements and whatever other specialized um, evidentiary proofs that are needed, the burden is on the government. That's what we've dealt with over and over and over again. Uh, but affirmative defenses uh, at least shift uh, uh, one of those burdens um, in most cases. Uh, and so, yeah, this is where I do want to distinguish. So the burden of production is not something we've talked a lot about. I've mentioned it before, which is this notion of just providing some evidence. That is something that applies to all our firm defenses. It means the defendant has to offer some evidence. And exactly how much is, you know, um, not well-defined necessarily. We'll see in our Flowers case that uh, the Mississippi court seems to think that mere testimony of a defendant that's self-serving isn't sufficient, but they do have some obligation to provide evidence, even if it's just a scintilla or or little, uh, or it could be their testimony. As I said, the Mississippi court might be a little too harsh in that case. Um, but what has changed is the burden of proof, um, at least for one of our defenses, and that's what Dixon's about here. So in the, the cases we've dealt with of abandonment 
of impossibility, even though we want to ignore that. Um, and then our justification necessity defense and duress. The defendant has the burden by a preponderance of evidence, so our civil standard, just over 50%, uh, to show that they were justified, right? that they had an, an absolute need that met the test, and they have to prove that by a preponderance of evidence. Similarly, duress, they have to show preponderance of evidence. Um, but in the 20th century, self-defense and defense of others, the burden shifted back to the government uh, for burden of proof. The burden of production is still there, but the burden of proof is uh, now in the government, which means the government has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant was not acting in self-defense or otherwise does not meet the self-defense or defense of others test. Um, and so what's going on in Dixon is this is a, de a defendant who is argued duress. They want to argue that, or they are, did argue, uh, that the burden – for duress should also shift. It's like, why is self-defense or defense of others any different? In fact, as we get more into the weeds of these affirmative defenses, you'll see that the the elements of self-defense and defense of others and duress have a lot of similarities. Um, and so why does self-defense or defense of others get a special status? And you'll notice the court doesn't really want to get into this. So even at the federal level, they're just like, you know, listen, this is the, the choice that's been made uh, by the legislatures. Um, it, it might not have a strong, logical or rational basis, but that's the way it is. And we'll talk a little bit more about why self-defense and defense others has gotten a special status when we get to that section. But this l sets out the lay of the land for us. So that's why Dixon is here in the intro and not in the duress section. Is it just shows us how these burdens work. And although Breyer and Souter dissented and, and would have, you know, um, had a different uh, um, burden here than uh, for duress, similar to self-defense, uh, that is the losing argument here. And, and this is at the federal level, but states are all in the same place uh, as far as self-defense and defense of others is concerned. Um, so these just set out the procedural framework for which we look at um, our subsequent subsections of this chapter in the same way that we read our uh, proof beyond a reasonable doubt case before we started in our main substantive law chapter. So this is just a case to outline those burdens. Okay, so what is justification? I gave the example of uh, stealing a car um, if somebody is about to die. Um, and as I said, this is the sort of core affirmative defense through which the other ones spring and then have developed their own additional pieces and doctrines. So this is, um, you know, sort of the, the root through which the, the trees spring. And in fact, in some jurisdictions, you'll see statutes which refer to everything as justification or necessity and then um, have um, specific forms of that, like self-defense or duress and so forth. So, But for our purposes, we're going to use justification necessity just to describe the cases that are, the types of cases that I'll, I'll look at today in this lecture and are included in this chapter in the book. Uh, one thing you might notice is that the test for what is justification or necessity, um, it's not... Um, precisely defined in the same way in every jurisdiction. So I included the excerpt from Paul Robinson, who's writing a, you know, general defenses sort of summary of the world, uh, the U.S., I should say, as it is today. Um, then we see the Flowers case, and then we see the Malone case. And in each of them, the test is stated differently. Uh, but it all, with the exception of Mississippi, which I think is a little lean on on specifics, they leave it up to the courts to fill those in. Um, we might divide this into five parts. Um, and this is not, you know, it, it embodies both the common law and NPC approach. Um, and all I've really done here is take the Robinson approach and um, take in that first sub one part, which is the choice of evils, and broken it into three parts. So the first three parts of this are actually all contained within that first sentence. But I think it's helpful to break them apart so that you don't overlook some of the language in there. And some jurisdictions like Pennsylvania do this. They break them out like this. So there is this choice of evil. So the notion is there has to be a greater evil averted uh, than the one caused. So you don't get to shoot somebody at the curb and say you stopped a jaywalking uh, because murder is worse uh, than jaywalking. So the evils have to be in the defendant's favor. They have to have committed a lesser one. There is some question of whether this should be subjectively or objectively 
appropriately defined. And we'll look at that in Malone, meaning should it be for the defendant's perspective or from a reasonable person's perspective? Then uh, the harm must be clear and imminent, uh, meaning that it, it has to be, you know, indisputable that it's occurring and it has to be in a very narrow time frame. Uh, so this is something that can really limit the availability of this defense um, for certain types of harms, uh, such as say climate change. Climate change is something that we would consider to be clear based on scientific consensus, but is not, it, at least the, the high degree of the harm is not imminent. Um, it's not in a short calculated time frame, which means that if you are protesting or committing uh, crimes to avoid climate change, the availability of this defense is, is not, um, it's just not there. Um, because unless you're just going to focus on the day-to-day -day potential harm that you could specifically trace to climate change, which seems unlikely. So we're really dealing with these, um, you know, immediate scenario or in a very near time frame. Um, three, the actions of the defendant are reasonably expected of avoiding the harm. So this is also important in the cases of protesters that go beyond protesting, which is merely wrecking stuff and destroying property um, is not uh, reasonably expected of avoiding harm. However, sometimes um, destroying something that's an instrument of the harm, you know, that, that you're seeking to avoid, uh, that is you know, it, it, there is a reasonable tie there between the two. So you don't get to just argue justification for, you know, outrage or destruction that is unrelated to avoiding uh, the harm. Um, and you'll notice there the word reasonably is positioned. So we don't uh, rely on subjective views of the defendant who might have um, grandiose or uh, just completely wrong visions about what their conduct will likely result in. And then uh, we get to two uh, different prongs uh, that really frustrate the large majority of our claims. Um, so even if a defendant can meet the choice of evils broken into those three parts, the last two are just really tough. So no legal alternative just means is there some way they could effectuate this avoidance of harm that's legal? In other words, if there is a way besides, say, shooting the jaywalker, even though that wouldn't meet our choice of evils, like telling them, watch out, it says don't walk right now, or potentially standing in their way, uh, then those have to be taken first. You don't get to resort to the criminal um, conduct as your first option. It should be the last of the legal alternatives. And so sometimes this is obviously a, a you know, a problem for defendants. But I think the one that's most frustrating, both from uh, a defendant's perspective and from an overall legal perspective, is the legislative purpose prong. Uh, the idea here is that defendants cannot um, uh, argue in a particular crime that they were justified if it would frustrate the legislative purpose of that statute. Um, and, you know, this is this is a really um, significant factor, um, and it's one that precludes even seemingly really strongly sympathetic, compelling cases for justification. Uh, and so we'll see this appear in a couple of our cases. So those, you, you know, however you want to frame it, um, as long as you cover these topics in an exam, uh, that's what I'm looking for. But I break it down to five parts. You'll also notice there is one more piece of the Robinson uh, definition, which sort of stands outside it, and it's not part of the test per se, um, but it says the defense is not available when uh, they created the de defendant, the defendant created the harm and evil, which they're now avoiding. Uh, so yeah, you don't get to cause a disaster and then commit a crime to avert that disaster. Uh, so yeah, this is sort of just a, a limitation on the overall test, uh, but it's included in the Robinson definition, so I wanna mention it here as well. Um, so let's dive into our cases. Uh, the first case, Flowers v. Mississippi, um, gives us, you know, uh, not so much an, an application of the test because the real difficulty in this case is the defendant was never afforded um, a, uh, a defense instruction at trial. It's more of a question of what does a defendant need to show, right? It gets to that question of burden of production and burden of proof that I mentioned at the outset. Uh, because here, uh, our defendant has an, you know, unusual defense for house burglary, right? You know, so they break into somebody's home. It's not the sort of crime you normally associate with justification. Why would you ever be justified breaking into someone's home? Well, Flowers contends, 
because I was running away from somebody shooting and killing me. So if we go back through our test, choi whoops, sorry, I went back one too far. Choice of evils, uh, I'm having trouble with my mouse today. Yes, mouse seems to be misbehaving. Okay, there we go. Uh, choice of evils. The death of flowers does seem to be less than the house breaking. So at that level, he would seem to meet it. The harm of somebody shooting at you is definitely clear and imminent, uh, presuming it is, in fact, somebody was shooting at him. A reasonable expectation of avoiding the harm? Yeah, hiding out's a, a good way to go. It's not, you know, the only way, but it certainly seems reasonable. No legal alternative. Well, that, that could have been an issue for Flowers. We never got to see it play out at trial because he wasn't offered the defense, right? Depending upon the geography of this Pacific environment, right, maybe it would be better for him to run to a public street that was available or uh, to actually continue on to, say, a convenience store that was right around the corner rather than breaking in someone's house. So depending upon uh, the specific facts of the scenario, the no legal alternative uh, might be an issue. And the legislative purpose problem would be a little tricky here, right? It's, it's clear that burglary statutes probably didn't anticipate this scenario. Would it frustrate overall burglary statutes? to allow this, you know, sort of scenario where somebody can flee an active shooter into somebody else's home, I, I think that the defendant here might have a good argument. So at least in my view, three of the, the prongs are met, absolutely, if the defendant can offer proof for this. And two of them should at least go to the jury and, and just see what they think and get their assessment over whether the defendant should be guilty or not guilty. So why, under these circumstances, oh, my mouse, I guess it's just my scroll wheel always wants to go down too. Um, so why then was the defendant not afforded this? It seems like if his argument fits well uh, within at least three, if not all five, of uh, the parts of the test. Shouldn't that go to the jury? Well, I think that the reason there's a um, dispute here, I mean, the majority ultimately does agree and says it should have gone to the jury, but I think the whole reason there was a dispute and why the judge denied the defense um, without explanation, right, just said, nope, not going to happen, um, is encapsulated with the dissent because, the, you know, it says this is not a defense of necessity case. Before anything else, the majority of opinions is incomplete without a fuller account of the testimony of James Fuchs, the citizen arrester. And so what he's essentially saying here, going through the whole background, is uh, Flowers just is completely not credible here. and This is just self-serving testimony. Now, this is a tough call. I, I tend to side with the majority here in thinking that, well, let, that's for the jurors to decide. They can decide credibility. They can, you know, hear the defense and assess whether or not it's reasonable. Um, and I think that's why the Mississippi court holds out the way it does. It says, you know, especially without any justification by the trial court, this should have been heard, right? Because a defendant's testimony is evidence. And if it's not credible evidence, that's for jurors to decide. But there are some facts here that really should make us doubt any credibility of Flowers. But the point of the majority opinion is not to assess the credibility of Flowers. It's not to say he had a credible argument. It's not to say he had a good argument, legally speaking. It's just to say the jurors should have gotten to hear it. So Flowers is telling us about what you would need to show to get a justification justification necessity defense. And quite often it is the self-serving testimony of the defendant. I think the dissent here um, is a little too harsh in its conclusion saying that we've denied self-defense based on self-serving testimony. I, I don't think that's quite true. And we'll talk about that more. I think it's more when the self-defense argument is contradicted by clear evidence the other way. But if there's an absence of evidence about what happened and there's no other witnesses, quite often a defendant's self-serving testimony about self-defense can result and a not guilty verdict, and the, the defense is heard. Um, but yeah, I think the majority is right here. Let's let the jur jurors hear this. These are all juror questions through each part of the test. As long as the defendant can meet the burden of production of offering at least some argument uh, or some statement within the context of the test itself. Okay, so that's Flowers. Then we get to a case that I both love and hate, uh, Pennsylvania v. Markham, which deals with a, a a type of fact pattern that emerges with frequency uh, in this area of justification necessity, which is protesters and civil disobedience. And of course, this is something that's uh, timely right now because of the numerous uh, protests around the country uh, in the wake of uh, the killing of, of George Floyd uh, while uh, being detained by police and as a accumulation of uh, numerous incidents of police violence against particularly African-American. American and uh, civilians. 
And so uh, protests are part of uh, uh, American culture, uh, as the majority even notes here, right? The majority gives um, what I might, you know, cynically call lip service, but maybe is genuine appreciation for at least uh, two prior uh, groups of protesters, uh, the Boston Tea Party and the civil rights protesters that uh, were in the middle 20th century against segregation of uh, the basis of race. Um, and you'll notice that this is a common pattern of opinions in this area. And I'm going to, we're going to talk about in class and also I'm going to start to talk about at the end of this uh, case why this is this pattern of saying, here's the good protesters, but you're a bad protester. There's not really a strong line or principle that divides those two groups. Um, it seems that defendants in the present moment are never in the good protesters. And it's only these historical groups that at the time were also not allowed a justification and necessity defense um, that we now revere them or um, appreciate their efforts. So the specifics of Markham, um, you know, are, you know, a series of, of protesters um, uh, that, you know, are still quite frequent in across the country, which are uh, people protesting against uh, abortion uh, at a clinic. And in this case, it just happens to be a clinic in Philadelphia. Um, but one of the reasons I love this case is uh, that it also contains an internal discussion of a previous uh, precedent in, in Pennsylvania, uh, which is the uh, Capitolo case, which is about nuclear power protesters. This, you know, might help us uh, just sort of set aside some of the, the politics inherent in protest where we might tend to be sympathetic with the protesters that are aligned on our part of the partisan spectrum. Although nuclear power protests have sort of fallen out as a, as a major cause, they're more identified with the left and anti-abortion protesters with the right. And so among, uh, you know, what we see is the same rule works against both uh, groups here. Um, and both of them are denied justification and necessity. But I do think there's actually some differences in the two cases when we look at our test. And for this reason, I think the strongest opinion in this case is actually the um, uh, uh, McEwen uh, concurring and dissenting opinion. I think it's the fairest uh, to both sides in here in terms of how to apply the test, whereas the majority seems to have what we might call log rolling, which is once the, the court decides that um, the defendant is going to lose. They seem to lose every part of the test, even though there are parts where they have a very reasonable argument. Um, and similarly, the, the dissent seems to have a very strong view in favor of the defendant uh, and also against abortion. Um, and they therefore think, oh, well, everything is, is completely viable here for the defendant. And it's not always that the compromise position is the right one, but I think that McEwen actually goes through the test in the most reasonable way but I also want us to go through the test for not just the anti-abortion protesters, but also uh, for the nuclear power uh, protesters. So in both cases, we have a uh, situation where people went beyond uh, mere protest, where they weren't just outside holding signs. They engaged in trespass and vandalism. And those are crimes, but they're, they're minor crimes. So if uh, the harm of that that is described in the defense is greater than either the vandalism or um, the trespass, then that at least gets their foot in the door in terms of arguing justification necessity. I think it's absolutely true um, for both sets of defendants, they should meet at least the first part of the choice of yields, just that sort of quantitative or qualitative weight of which harm is worse. Um, so in the context of nuclear power, um, there's a lot of different harms that can be cited. It could be the threat of a meltdown, which was often the concern at the time that case was made. But uh, it can also be just the, the fact that we don't have a long-term waste storage um, for, so nuclear power plants are regularly producing waste, which are stored, which is stored on site and can cause environmental damage. So they can have an immediate sort of harm in a long-term harm. And I mentioned that, of course, for when we get to the second part of the test. The choice of evils is a little different for the anti-abortion protesters, and this is where I think the majority probably is a bit wrong. Um, the majority wholly discounts uh, the death of unborn fetuses in uh, the case and saying that because of Roe v. Wade, that's not a cognizable or recognized harm. 
Um, and I don't think that's fair to the way the test should work. Um, now, I mentioned at the outset that there's nothing about the choice of evils that specifically says whether it has to be a wholly subjective or wholly objective test. But I think it's fair to say every jurisdiction includes subjectivity here. It just, you don't hold it to a wholly reasonable person standard. But maybe there's a jurisdiction out there and I just haven't read a case. Cases rise somewhat infrequently in here at the appellate court level. And so in this idea, it is a subjective harm, certainly to the defendants, because they believe uh, that the onboard pieces are human life. So this is just murder. Um, so I think from that standpoint, they should definitely be able to argue it because the jurors are free to reject that claim, right? The jurors are free to say, no, this type of harm we don't consider to be as great as the trespass and vandalism. I don't know why that should necessarily be a judicial question. And even if the unborn fetus is not considered a human being, it can still be a harm, right? That's something we talked about in our fetal homicide laws, how uh, just because, you know, whether you call it homicide or not, uh, Teresa Keeler, when she was beaten brutally and lost her unborn uh, future child, um, that was a loss and that was a harm. And um, the court, I think, is, is just too bold here in dismissing this as a harm, both subjectively and for, you know, the fact that it is recognized culturally as a harm, even without a strong anti-abortion uh, view. So, yeah, I will. I think that, that the choice of evils works at least the first step for both defendants here. The clear and imminent harm is where things start to diverge. As I mentioned, nuclear power if the risk of a meltdown is not an imminent harm, right? E clear is even debatable because of its incredible infrequency and how rarely we've had events. But even if we assume it's clear on a long-term scale, it is not imminent. Unless there are very particular things like this nuclear power plant has, you know, been rumbling and there's no safety protocols, but whatever the reasons, right? If it's like a pre-Chernobyl uh, situation, uh, then it might apply. But that doesn't mean they lose. It just means that now we've had to shape the harm differently because we can only focus on clear and imminent harm. So it might just be the nuclear waste environmental risk, which they might still be able to argue, you know, is, is greater than the trespass, which does in, in the context of nuclear power represent maybe other dangers. Uh, but now we have to reshape our, our framing here, which is we have to remove any harms that are not imminent. Um, whereas I do think uh, that the anti-abortion protesters in the, the prime case here can uh, focus on clear and imminent harm. But again, there's a scope limiting, which means is that their shutting down of the facility um, is uh, for whatever period of time they're able to, they might be able to argue that abortions were pre um, prevented. Right. It's possible somebody went to another facility, comes back as soon as it reopens, but there's at least an imminent harm. Right. So uh, because it's done on a regular basis. Now, they can't claim the harm of, say, this is going to lead to the, the stopping of all abortions nationwide because that's not what their conduct does. And that's where it leads into the third part of this test. So the conduct of the defendants, reasonable expectation of avoiding harm. I think, again, the nuclear power protesters are actually in a far worse position here. Um, breaking into a facility and even vandalizing it does nothing to prevent a uh, the nuclear waste storage. It doesn't even shut down the facility. Um, so uh, it, the production of waste will continue, even if we were to include the risk of a meltdown, which we're you know saying isn't imminent. It, there are protests that have you know gone beyond this sort of civil disobedience it's not reasonably going to stop the harms associated with the nuclear power plant. The anti-abortion protesters here have a mixed argument, I'd say. I think they're actually, you know, this is one of the interesting situations where they probably have a better argument on um, in the, the charge that's most serious, right? So there's several charges uh, here for anti-abortion protesters. Um, the trespassing and putting pro-life stickers on the doors and walls and ceilings, that is unlikely to avoid the harm at all, right? It just, it's, it's, you know, especially versus a legal alternative, right? It's just messaging. They could have messaged outside with their stickers and signs. It just does not seem in any way reasonably designed in a way that will avoid the harm. However, the more serious crime here, which is they damaged two aspirator machines and other med medical instruments and threw equipment out the third floor, that might 
right? That might be a situation where the facility has to close down and they cannot offer abortion services during that time. But then now that we've done that, we have to think of, and this is, I think, why Robinson groups them all into one because they are interrelated, but I just want to highlight their different aspects. But once you get to that, you say, okay, well, now it's really the destruction of property crime that there's a viable defense here. We have to you know, put that into the choice of evils framework. So when the jurors would be instructed, if it were to go to the jurors, um, it would have to be, is that destruction of medical equipment and property, that crime, a worse or lesser evil than any potential abortions that might reasonably be stopped by uh, the defendant's conduct? And that would be up for the jurors to decide. So those are the first three parts or the part that Robinson groups together, the choice of evils uh, broken down. Uh, but then we get to, as I said, these two problematic prongs. And this is, as I said, I think where McEwen does a good job of saying, well, listen, even, even if the defendants have a good argument here on the first three issues, we're starting to run into trouble. Um, the no legal alternative is a little tough, right? Because, yeah, it's true that protesting outside the fence of the nuclear power plant or outside the facility under regulatory uh, limitations that exist, uh, the, uh, the abortion facility, um, you can protest, yell, uh, you can do a lot of different things. Are those going to accomplish the same? Well, at least in the anti-abortion protesters, we could say, well, it won't destroy the property and prevent it from being done. So arguably, no legal alternative could work there. Um, nuclear power, yeah, again, I think that, that, that because they're all they've really done is relocate their protests and tried to form an arm ring, which doesn't really stop anything. I think they have a, a worse legal alternative argument as well. Well here. So actually between the two cases, I think the anti-abortion protesters are doing better at our second, third, and fourth prongs um, than the nuclear power protesters. But then both of them, both of them absolutely lose at the fifth part of the test. Um, and so it doesn't really matter that, you know, uh, the anti-abortion protesters were doing better up till now um, because the legislative purpose prong is frustrating and frustrating to um, uh, defendants. And so what, what do I mean here? Well, our property statutes, you know, destruction of property, vandalism type laws, you know, it would frustrate their purpose if people were able to say, but I get to destroy property that it serves in things that I don't like or I don't support or I think are immoral. Um, it would just open far too big a loophole into our uh, whole notion of private property. And so, yeah, I just don't think that there are anti-abortion protesters are well situated. And similarly, I think, you know, the, the trespass statutes, although in general, there can be justifications for trespass. Uh, in the nuclear power context, it's really hard to support uh, because the danger the facilities might represent or the fact that these might not be innocent protesters. Uh, but the simple fact is legislative purpose is a really strong bar uh, to defendants even getting this defense in the door. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit later about what can meet the legislative purpose because it seems like, well, isn't this just going to be across the board, a, a, an absolute block? Oh, I said in flowers, maybe not. And I'll talk about one specific instance where it's not, but I want to put that aside for now. And so, yeah, I think that both the majority and dissent are maybe a little caught up in the political divide over abortion. Um, and uh, the the mixed concurring dissent opinion might be best. And I, I think one reason to think that is um, when we start to look at some of the reasoning of uh, the majority here, as I mentioned, the majority, you know, says, well, what about, you know, this, these, these protesters, these protesters are not the good ones, right? They're, they're not like the Boston Tea Party. They're not like the civil rights protesters protesting against segregation. And I think the dissent does a good job of pointing out at least partly why these arguments are flawed. And it makes the dissent, I think, seem stronger than maybe it should from a legal perspective because this distinction is nonsense. Um, one test that might seem appealing at face value, but I encourage you to think critically about, is, well, listen, the anti-abortion protesters don't have any good argument because they're not violating the law they're protesting. And so that would be different, right? That would be different if you actually violated it. The dissent rightfully point out, points out that that's impossible to do in this situation, right? It's, if somebody's protesting the, the right or allowance of a state uh, to um, 
give people the right to abortion, um, you can't violate that, right? Would you go in and and when you're pregnant and say, ha I won't have an abortion? No, that doesn't even – it's not a crime, but it also doesn't really violate the, the law. You can't violate something like that. So that's that seems problematic. Um, but in fact, this isn't even true. It isn't true of the civil rights protesters. And it's not true of the Boston Tea Party, right? The Boston Tea Party, um, they were protesting tea taxes and a long-term mistreatment by the parliament and various other factors. But what crime did they commit? Destruction of property, right? The same thing that the anti-abortion protesters did. They threw it into the water. They didn't not pay their taxes, right? They were not tax protesters. Those are people that try to argue that justification and necessity and lose under the fifth prong, if not earlier. Um, but it's not true, right? So we might look at these people as heroes who helped form our country, but they would not have been afforded the justification and necessity defense under our modern doctrine or the doctrine at the time. But what about the civil rights protesters? Similarly, they were protesting... Um, uh, uh, segregation laws, which sometimes were codified as part of the G Jim Crow regime. But in most instances, um, the crimes they were arrested and charged with were, again, very much like our protesters here. Trespass, right? It was their failure to leave, say, the Woolworth restaurant when they sat in at the counter that was for whites only, right? One of the most famous protests in North Carolina. This is, this is the type of protest that was occurring, that emerged all across the nation. Invariably, defendants were charged with trespass. They weren't protesting trespass laws, right? They weren't saying, no, no, there's no such thing as private property that other people can't walk on, that basically we have easements for everywhere. No, they were protesting a specific regime that had been in place after the Civil War that uh, prevented access of African Americans to the same facilities as uh, whites. And so, yeah, neither of these populations can easily meet a test that sounds superficially appealing, but is really just window dressing, I think, to, for the majority to try and say, you know, that, hey, we're not saying all protesters that, that engage in civil disobedience are denied this defense, because that's what they really are saying. Um, and it's a simple reality that at the time, those civil rights protesters lost under a test that's just like the modern test. And war protesters in Vietnam, in uh, the Iraq War the first time, in the Iraq War the second time, in the Afghanistan War, all of them have lost. Right? This is something, occasionally you see, will see a case that at least goes to trial, the jurors might found not guilty, but that's, it might we think of nullification, not really an application of the doctrine. Occasionally there's some little wrangling between the appellate court and the trial court over whether the defense should be given. But the simple fact is defendants lose. And we don't have a right to civil disobedience in this country. And so, you know, if you if you think we should have one, we need to change this test. And if not, then I just think we should be honest about that. I think that the majority here likes to, to pretend that there are these good idyllic protesters out there uh, when there aren't. And they're not alone. So the fact that I'm picking on this one Pennsylvania court um, is not targeting them specifically. You will often see courts say, oh, the civil rights protesters uh, protesting against segregation and Boston Tea Party. Those are their favorite two examples to use. Those were different. And they come up with distinctions which might sound reasonable until you actually think them through. Um, and so I want to just point out that this is the, the rule here is civil disobedience is almost never, if not ever, going to be able to take advantage of a justification necessity defense. And that's the simple reality of it. Um, let's talk about some other cases where this sometimes emerges. Uh, so, I mean, justification and necessity emerge. One is economic necessity. So if a person, for example, is lacking money and therefore commits a property-based crime uh, or, you know, something that, that acquires money or goods or food uh, to feed themselves or their family, can they argue economic necessity? Um, you know, you'll see very similar result that we saw on our, our previous cases, which is uh, they might be able to all choice of evils, right? Somebody starving to death or not being malnourished as a child or something can be a greater evil than the loss of property to, say, a shopkeeper who might not even notice. The harm can be clear and imminent, depending upon the nature of uh, malnutrition or starvation. Uh, reasonably expected of avoiding the harm? Absolutely, right? Getting food at least temporarily solves that harm and prevents the problem. No legal alternative. Some defendants are able to show this. Um, it's going to depend. Um, there was one case in Texas uh, in the 70s uh, which dealt with the sort of 
um, paradox of, well, I won't say paradox, uh, the, the catch-22 of um, welfare, because welfare payments uh, for uh, families with children were, as they've often been, much like the minimum wage, not linked to inflation. Uh, so over time, as inflation increases and the government allocation of uh, um, resources stays static, uh, then there creates a problem. Because what might have been um, possible for a person to survive on uh, in a desperate situation uh, is no longer sufficient. And in this case, the defense even had experts to this effect and said, absolutely, positively, this money no one can survive on. And if they even got an employed at this point in a part-time or full-time job, uh, they would lose their benefits and they might end up financially, you know, in a more precarious situation depending upon if their part-time job were not sufficient. And so in this case, a defendant had a very, very strong no legal alternative. There's also cases from World War II about the rationing system that, you know, sometimes didn't give enough flour. So sometimes there are instances where no legal alternative. But for the most part now, as long as the notion is that our economy is functioning, we say people can acquire money through work or begging or whatever, um, even if that's pretty unrealistic, uh, all courts will sometimes say there's, there were legal alternatives here. But all the defendants tend to lose here at the legislative purpose prong, which is the notion of theft laws would seem to preclude economic necessity arguments because otherwise people would regularly assert the necessity of uh, the good that they must take. And he might even have very compelling cases. And our law just doesn't have any mention of that possibility or recognition of that possibility. Um, and so economic necessity invariably fails as well. Uh, so rather than read cases, I just figure it's better to uh, go through uh, that in, um, you know, sort of a summary of the area. Uh, I, I do have to keep going back and forth through the slides there. Uh, so medical necessity. Well, this is now a moment where defendants are still losing like they do most of the time, but at least there was one class of defendants that win. And so this will show you at least one way that defendants have um, um, gotten past that legislative purpose prong. Um, and so uh Medical necessity, of course, can arise in, in a variety of manners, but it, it tends to revolve around illegal drugs. Um, so uh, marijuana being the most prominent instance in the modern era where defendants have tried to argue uh, pre-decriminalization or legalization in some states, and there's still a lot of federal laws out there, so it's not wholly legal. They've tried to argue that uh, marijuana is important, say, uh, if you're undergoing chemotherapy for your ability to retain food and prevent uh, excessive vomiting, which is often essential for survival. Um, glaucoma, um, there's a lot of medical conditions that have been connected uh, with marijuana use, but it can also apply in other areas, um, and I'll talk a couple of those in a minute. Um, but I mentioned marijuana first, uh, because, again, we just see defendants losing across the board in these cases, although occasionally they get to jurors and jurors would find that guilty or prosecutors would exercise discretion and not uh, pursue charges. But uh, there were one, there was one group of defendants in before this modern decriminalization, legalization world uh, appeared, but it's something that at least in some states would still be quite relevant, which is in the state of Washington. Uh, Washington long had recognized uh, the fact that marijuana might be usable for uh, medical purposes. And so their criminalization of marijuana possession specifically mentioned this possibility and created basically a statutory necessity defense, which is if the person has genuine medical need uh, for marijuana, then they should not be found guilty. They should have an affirmative defense, uh, which they can show by preponderance of evidence that they had a medical condition that justified it, and therefore they go through the test, and if they could establish that, they should be found not guilty at trial. But you see what happened there is that they had to be written into the statute. It's almost like the defense is not freestanding. It, it really required uh, extra statutory language to make it winnable and viable. Um, and so this is one instance where medical necessity has, has worked out uh, for a defendant, but a, a lot of cases uh, it hasn't. Um, sometimes, though, as I said, prosecutors decide not to pursue this, particularly if somebody's at the end of life, right? If they're get, trying to get access to drugs that aren't legal in the U.S., often because they weren't uh, finished with FDA approval or something like that, um, you know, the, 
there's the desire to prosecute uh, should be quite low if there's any rationale for it, uh, because the person is on the verge of death. And so um, even pursuing it just seems uh, pointless at that point. But there's also been some cases with some pretty compelling arguments that defendants have not been able to to use uh, the medical necessity argument to their advantage. Uh, so one of these concerns thalidomide, which was uh, some of you may know is a, a famous drug, uh, infamous, I should say, that many pregnant mothers uh, took in the middle of the 20th century uh, to avert uh, morning sickness, nausea, and other side effects of uh, pregnancy. Uh, but this drug was not good. It was uh, poorly uh, tested and resulted in lots of, of litigation and a withdrawal from the market because it caused extreme birth defects, um, malformation of limbs, all sorts of major problems. And so it was pulled from the market. But then a strange thing happened, and I, I want to say this is the late 80s, early 90s, around that time, which is uh, in the desperate attempt to find treatments for HIV and AIDS, uh, somebody found, at one point, promising results from using thalidomide on AIDS patients. Um, but it was illegal uh, to you know, uh, produce, sell, possess this drug uh, because it had been removed from the market. But the defense here had a, had a pretty strong argument that the reason it was removed would not apply and if not the entirety of the population that wanted to use this drug or you could limit it to non-pregnant persons right in other words the only side effects were to the fetus in these situations and so it, why not allow people to use it uh, for a deadly virus that at this point we had almost no um, good treatments for? And again, defendants were not allowed to use this medical necessity argument. So even in you know seemingly unique, compelling situations. So what is the big lesson here before we get to our last case, which is sort of different and stands for a different principle? It's that even if a defendant can meet the first four parts of the test as I've described it, that fifth part is, is just a really high hurdle. And so there's probably only two ways to surmount it, both of which we've seen. One is the Washington State Marijuana Law Exception, which is the law itself has created a separate specific exception, which then effectuates the general necessity defense because it says for this specific scenario, this specific crime, justification might be allowed. If that were the only way to get the justification necessity defense, then it's kind of pointless, right? Because why not just always rely on the specific statutory language? So the second scenario, and again, it, this one's a little harder to define and tends to, um, you know, just be um, sort of sporadically found, might be found in our Flowers case, right? Now, we don't know that Flowers was justified or had necessity, but it was sort of the unique, unusual scenario that wasn't anticipated wasn't likely anticipated by the legislatures when they adopted the law that was being violated. In other words, it's easy to imagine trespass laws would be used to keep protesters and other people off of private commercial property. It's not the core purpose, but it's one of the purposes. Um, similarly, you know, in, in lots of contexts, you know, or we could say destruction of property would include, you know, destruction of private lab equipment. Those are just sort of built into the law. But the notion that a home burglary law might be violated because somebody was pursuing a fleeing shooter, that probably wasn't something that they might have thought out ahead of time. And so they wouldn't have adopted the very specific language that the Washington State, that Washington State did, or did around marijuana. And so therefore, maybe that should go to the jury because it wasn't frustrating a clear legislative purpose. Similarly, the example I gave at the outset of somebody breaking into a car to uh, save somebody who's dying and there's no other resources available, um, that's another situation where, yeah, car theft laws are important and, and are, you know, necessary to prevent a harm, but they might, the legislature might not have anticipated that sort of scenario. So we look at these other cases that don't fit the Washington State marijuana law. It's just sort of being outside of the legislators purview at the time they passed the law, or at least they weren't concerned. You know, we might say it's a reasonable foreseeable test, except that they I haven't seen that language used. It's just they didn't think about it. And so at least then we should allow it to go to the jurors and the jurors should decide if the legislative purpose of the law being violated was frustrated by the specific scenario outlined uh, by the defendant. Okay.
Then we get to our last case, which is a bit um, gratuitous, although not in the way you think. For whatever reason, uh, law students love talking about cannibalism. I can't explain it. Maybe it's just at this point in the semester, you're a little punchy, a little worn out, and this seems like a strange sort of uh, um, thing to think about. Um, there's some law professors who contend that the Dudley and Stevens case, which is in every criminal law case book, um, you could teach the whole criminal law course out of it. Uh, in fact, I think some professors have almost tried that. Uh, I do not believe that. I, I, as you know from this book, I think that folks on modern law and um, what is reflected in the U.S., you know, is sort of our focus. That's what we should be doing. But I make an allowance here. Uh, this is a classic case, and I do know that students enjoy thinking about this because it allows particularly those of us, who, those in the group who are, you know, um, have a little more philosophy background and sort of like this moral decision making, uh, thinking about lifeboat ethics or things. Or maybe they've just watched a few too many episodes of The Good Place. Uh, whatever the reason is, uh, there's there, we can have a discussion in class about this. Uh, so we'll look at Dudley and Stevens in, in a little detail. I'll forge you uh, like maybe 50 or 20 minutes. Um, but for our purposes, the rule is still true that you don't get to argue justification and necessity if the crime charge is homicide, uh, meaning that you cannot commit homicide to avert a greater crime. Now, that, of course, that's not that's only true for this affirmative defense. As I said, self-defense and defense of others is now emerges its own thing. So that's a case where you can commit homicide to avert a greater harm, um, but it has to be defending others or yourself or your person. So you might be able to, for example, shoot a terrorist uh, who's about to commit you know crime, killing you know tens of thousands or something like that, um, rather than framing that as a justification or. Um, uh, uh, necessity defense argument, it's better to just put it in the self-defense and uh, defense of others category. So this rule, this bar against necessity justification in homicide cases is only in the common law. It's not specifically in the MPC. Um, so at least in MPC jurisdictions, it's possible that you can um, make this argument, but it's it tends to be precluded a lot uh, under real world scenarios um, because of the fact that it's hard to avoid greater harms that aren't already captured by the self-defense argument. And if you have self-defense or defense of others available, it's better for the defendant to go that route. I mean, you can put both as possibilities, but because the burden of proof is on the government on the self-defense and defense of others, you'd much rather be arguing that than justification, which is a harder test uh, to meet. And so in the real world, these cases almost never, ever, 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 ever emerge. Um, these revolve around what we call in philosophy or in the good place, uh, trolley problems, um, which is you're choosing between two bad scenarios, which invariably include death. Um, here we had people on a lifeboat, um, and uh, as they're starving and they're near death, they ultimately killed the child, uh, which, you know, we might wonder if that's the particular problem of this case. The opinion itself is extremely British, um, meaning that it seems like at times that the court is is maybe more upset uh, that the defendants were not good British gentlemen uh, more than they were murderers, right? That there seemed to be this obligation to go down with the ship, so to speak. And so, uh, yeah, they ultimately do not allow a necessity defense. And this is the common rule, that law rule that's continued. And even though the MPC drafters didn't specifically preclude it, there's not many scenarios where it could emerge. Although at least in this case, right, this sort of lifeboat scenario, under the MPC, uh, the defendant should be able to present to the jurors their arguments, and the jurors can decide whether or not they meet the justification necessity test. So we'll talk a little bit more in class about this, uh, but it is not a common real-world scenario for obvious uh, reasons. Uh, so that's it for today. Uh, next time, I will move on to self-defense and defense of others, and we will conclude the course on duress.